Great seat to come to order. Court is again in session. Thank you, Deputy Jones. In Dr. Murray's case, the defendant is present with counsel as before. The people by counsel as before. Dr. Rogers, once again, is on the witness stand as before. All jurors and alternates are present as well. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Dr. Rogers, good afternoon again, sir. Uh, good afternoon. Sir, do you acknowledge you are still under oath and still sworn to tell the truth? Yes. Thank you. The resumption of cross-examination by Mr. Flanagan. We were, we were talking about lorazepam, doctor. Uh, are you familiar with the half-life of lorazepam? Yes. And according to, would that be somewhere between 9 and 16 hours? Yes. And... Uh, what that means is if a person had a 0.16 level of lorazepam in their blood, somewhere between 9 and 16 hours later, they'd still have a 0.08, wouldn't they? Yes. Uh, 0.08 is still a lot of lorazepam, isn't it? Uh, well, I think it's enough to produce an effect. Well, and as we've previously discussed, one pill will get you to a 0.018, correct? Yes. And that's the, the prescribed dose for therapeutic effect, isn't it? Uh, yes. Okay, now, would you agree that it would take more pills of lorazepam to achieve same level, more milligrams by pill to achieve the same level as you would an equal amount of uh, the equal level with. <laughs> let me let me start over, Your Honor. That's vague. It takes more oral form of lorazepam to achieve the same blood level as IV form, doesn't it? Yes. So where the blood form, where, where blood has 100% bioavailability, oral pills have less than 100% bioavailability, don't they? Oral. Uh, bioavailability is one reason for the difference. So do you know what level two milligram dose of IV lorazepam would achieve in blood? Expertise, Your Honor. If you know, you may answer. If not, you can tell us. Uh, I don't know. Okay. Sustain. When you uh, formed your opinion as to cause of death, you looked at the levels in the blood, the postmortem levels of propofol? Yes. And you looked at the postmortem level of the benzodiazepine, which was primarily lorazepam, correct? Yes. Now, did you form an opinion? as to whether or not either one of those levels, either the level for propofol or the level for the benzo or for the lorazepam, separate and in of itself would be lethal. Yes. Now, the propofol level, which you consider the conscious sedation dose of two micrograms per milliliter, the anesthetic dose of four micrograms per milliliter. Did you form an opinion as to what the, a lethal dose of propofol would be? Um, based on the medical literature, yes. 
okay? What is the lethal level for propofol? Uh, it can range between 1 and 17 micrograms per milliliter. 1 all the way up to 17? Yes. And what literature did you rely upon to form that opinion? Uh, I'm using a toxicology table put out by Winnick. Could, could you say that again? Uh, again, I'm having a little trouble hearing you on the in-court mic. I'm, I'm using a toxicology table put out by Winnick. Okay. Now, if a person is at a point, uh, uh, two give us, point. Just give us just a moment, please. Again, the in-court system is different than an out-of-court system, and there, there are some problems here, so Deputy Jones is going to. Help us out a little bit. If you give me a moment. Well, that's the easy part. Give it to tap. Could you tap? Speak a little closer into it. It'll help us out. I'm sorry for the interruption, Mr. Flanagan. A person at a 2.6 level of propofol. You could wake them up with painful stimuli, couldn't you? Objection. Uh, there's many variables in proper hypothetical. Just by itself? Yes. Overall, you may answer. Uh, you should be able to wake them up. I mean, you, you, you stick, a, stick a scalpel in somebody with a 2.6, you'd expect them to feel pain, wouldn't you? Yes. Uh, do you know what the anesthetic level is for lorazepam? I don't know. Do you know what the level would be for lorazepam to describe the person, patient subject only to painful stimulus? Responsive to painful stimulus. You know what that level is? Do you understand the question? Uh, I understand the question. Are you comfortable in answering it, or is it beyond your expertise? Uh, that would be beyond my expertise. And likewise, the blood level that would cause a patient to be unresponsive to painful stimulus. I take it you don't know that. That's correct. Well, when you uh, concluded that uh, lorazepam had some sort of causative effect in the death or benzodiazepines, are, are, are we talking just benzodiazepines or lorazepam solely as having a causative effect in Mr. Jackson's death? Uh, well, we're talking about lorazepam and midazolam. But the midazolam is insignificant, really. There is a smaller amount, yes. Well, what was the amount? Uh, the amount of midazolam in the blood was 0. 0.0046 micrograms per milliliter. So when you talk about smaller amount, it's, about, it's between 2 and 3 percent, isn't it? Yes. So we're really talking about, when you're talking about benzodiazepine, you're talking about lorazepam, aren't you? Mostly, yes. And when you determined that it was a causative factor in the death, did you do some research to find out exactly how high a level that is? Uh, yes. Did you, did you make a determination as to how many milligrams it would take to get there? Uh, no, I could not make that determination. Well, when, when, would you be able to make that determination if you knew that the SALT study shows that 2 okay. milligrams will get you to a 0.018? Objection. You already answered the question. Sustain. Well, assuming 
then if we assume, based upon your prior answer, that two milligrams gets you to a 0.018, would you have an idea how many milligrams takes to get to a 0.169? At what? There's many variables. At what time were the pills taken, et cetera? It's an improper hypothetical. I'll overrule the objection. If you're able to answer it as phrased, let us know. If not, let us know. Now, could could you repeat the question, please? Okay. Sustain. Based upon your previous agreement, that one pill will get you to a point oh one eight. That's one two milligram pill. How many two milligram pills would it take to get you to a point one six nine if they were taken at the same time? How much objection? How much time between taking the pills and measuring the blood levels? Well, let's just go peak level. Assuming I, one I six nine. I have to re-ask the question. Sustain. Okay. Assuming the peak level that you get with a, point, a two milligram pill is a point oh one eight. How many pills would it get you take you to get to the peak level of 0.169? It would take about nine pills, I believe. So that'd be nine times the recommended dose on the prescription bottle that we were looking at. Correct? Yes. Now, I am, I, am I correct in assuming that the coroner's office did not examine the, you didn't examine the stomach contents for lorazepam, correct? That's correct. You didn't examine the urine samples for lorazepam either, did you? Uh, that is also correct. But you did examine the urine samples for midazolam, didn't you? Yes. Why? Objection calls for speculation. He's not the toxicologist. The objection's overruled. Uh, I don't know. The choice of testing is made by the toxicologist. Okay. But the rasapan was way more significant than midazolam, wasn't it? Objection made. Overruled. Yes. Now, in the urine sample, you had a urine sample that was about 450 cc's that based upon Dr. Murray's statement to the police was, a, was collected somewhere between the hours of 7 and 7.30. You recall reading that? Uh, this, I believe, was the urine sample that was present at the house. You refer to it as a seen urine in the report? Seen urine, yes. Seen urine. Now, in addition to the seen urine, urine collected uh, approximately four and a half. Well, it wasn't the, the autopsy urine wasn't collected till the next day, was it? It was collected on the day of the autopsy, which would be the 26th. But you would expect it to reflect the urine status at time of death, wouldn't you? Well, it would be an average of whatever the urine status was since the last time he urinated. Okay, so if, if that would be an app, probably an average, if the last time he urinated was 7.30, the 12 o'clock, time of death or approximate 12 o'clock time of death, uh, it would be an average of uh, urine collected during that interval of time, wouldn't it? Yes. And that, and the urine comes out of the bloodstream, doesn't it? Yes. And the urine collected at between 7 and 7.30 would be an average of the urine collected from the last time before 7.30 that the individual urinated, wouldn't it? Yes. And that would be a produced out of the blood also, wouldn't it? Yes. And so urine testing from that standpoint 
although not as precise as a blood sample, basically reflects what's coming out of the blood, doesn't it? Yes. Now, if we had a urine sample at time of autopsy that is uh, higher than the urine sample collected the seen urine at between 7 and 7.30, if the urine sample at autopsy were higher in lorazepam content, you would expect the blood to be higher in lorazepam content also, wouldn't you? Objection, speculation beyond his area of expertise. If you know, you may answer. If not, tell me. Well, I'm not sure I understand the question. Okay. Sustain. If the urine sample at time of autopsy reflects a higher level of lorazepam than the urine sample at 730. You would expect the blood to have more lorazepam at time of autopsy than the blood had at time of, at 730, wouldn't you? Same objection, same question. Are you able to answer the question? Mm, no, I, I don't think so. Why not? Well, because it depends on things like when does he get the lorazepam, how fast is he making urine. There, there are several variables in there that make it difficult to answer. Overruled with that answer in mind. Okay, so uh, if a person took... If a person had four milligrams of urine, say it, two, at, two milligrams at two o'clock and two milligrams at, at five o'clock, and then took eight lorazepam pills at about 10 o'clock, would you expect the urine concentration to be higher at time of autopsy? than it was at 7.30. Objection has already indicated he needs to know the answers to other variables, such as urination, et cetera. Sustained. This is so that you only, the person urinated at 7.30, and there was a lorazepam content in the urine. And then the person took eight lorazepam pills at 10 o'clock. Would you expect there to be a higher lorazepam content in the urine at time of autopsy? Yes. And that is because you would expect a higher blood concentration of lorazepam at autopsy, too, isn't it? Yes. Now, I want to talk a little bit about your, your, your coroner's report. Uh, you determined the death in this case to be a homicide, didn't you? Yes. And in making that determination, You based it on four assumptions. Uh, there were four factors which led to that conclusion. The uh, first factor
That was circumstances indicate that, a, that propofol and the benzodiazepines were administered by another. That's factor number one. Yes. What makes you think so? Well, the only indication that we have of what happened is what Dr. Murray told the police, and he said that he did give benzodiazepines and propofol. But Dr. Murray indicated that, that he slowly infused 25 milligrams of propofol over three to five minutes, didn't it? Yes. That wouldn't get you to a 2.6 micrograms per milliliter, would it? Uh, probably not by itself. Okay. And Dr. Murray also told you that he gave two, two milligram injections in the IV of lorazepam. Two, also, didn't he? Yes. And that won't get you to a 0.169 lorazepam level in the femoral vein, will it? I, I don't, I think we may have discussed this earlier. I'm not sure what, what concentration you would get to based on those injections. You've read Schaefer's report, haven't you? Yes. And Schaefer describes now those, those two injections, if Dr. Murray were telling the truth, would leave you at a .02 at time of autopsy. Isn't that what it says? Well, I don't recall what it says about that. Okay. You also stated that your finding number two, the propofol was administered in a non-hospital setting without any appropriate medical indication. Was that a conclusion of yours? Yes. Do you consider... Insomnia, uh, what they, refractory, chronic, primary insomnia. So your opinion, you can't treat that with, uh, with uh, propofol? I believe that in general it is not appropriate to treat insomnia with propofol. Now, whether there are specific kinds of insomnia, such as refractory primary insomnia, that would need to be treated with propofol, I don't know. Did you make a determination as a result of your investigation, not only your autopsy, but your other investigation? I, I think there was a review, review of records. There was. Uh, did you make a determination as to whether or not Mr. Jackson had refractory, chronic, primary insomnia? Uh, no, I believe the only diagnosis mentioned was insomnia. Uh, does insomnia differ in degrees? Yes. Did you uh, determine the degree of insomnia that Mr. Jackson had? No. Would you disagree with propofol being used to treat refractory chronic primary insomnia? I think that would be beyond my area of expertise. Okay. The, uh, you entered, you, your third finding, the standard, I, I'm, I'm, I'm reading it 
from your third finding. The standard of care for administering propofol was not met, and then parentheses, C anesthesia consultation. Recommended equipment for patient monitoring, precision dosing, resuscitation was not present. Is, is that within your expertise to determine? Uh, no, that was the determination of the anesthesiologist, which was one of the basis for my opinion. Okay, so that, that third finding is beyond your expertise? Yes. Okay. Now the fourth finding. The circumstances do not support self-administration of propofol. And now, for that, did you rely upon an anesthesiology consult? Uh, in part, yes. What's the other part? Well, we don't really know what happened when Dr. Murray went to the bathroom. And so we have to think about what's reasonable. Uh, to me, it seems like it's reasonable to believe that the doctor had an imperfect control over the dose and he may have accidentally given too much. The theory that seems less reasonable to me is that Mr. Jackson woke up and although he was under the influence of sedative medications, managed to give himself another dose and the uh, new dose circulated through the body enough that he stopped breathing by the time Dr. Murray came back and that all of this happened within two minutes. So to me, that seems like the less reasonable possibility. Okay, you're, you're talking about two different possibilities, one less reasonable than the other, correct? Yes. But both reasonable. Well, I guess it's a matter of degree, you know. Okay. Um, now, in that consult, reasons given why it was probably not self-administered is because of the positioning. One of the reasons was the positioning of the IV line, wasn't it? Yes. The IV was... Uh, was uh, inserted in the calf, just above the calf, kind of almost behind the knee, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Mistakes testimony. Overruled, if you're able to tell us. Where, where was the IV inserted? The IV was just below the left knee. And the IV, it... How long a line did it have before you got to the Y port? that our criminalist made, which I am not finding in this material that I have. I think if you go to Dr. Salmos's report, page two. Oh, yes, okay. So, so she says that uh, the injection port was 13.5 centimeters from the tip of the catheter. So, in other words... The distance between the the part where it goes into the leg and the part where you inject 
is 13.5 centimeters. Uh, that would be on the order of, well, let's see, two and a half inches per centimeter. Maybe five or six? Five or six inches, something like that. Five or like six that. inches? Yes. And so the furthest, the, if the IV was stretched the opposite direction, the furthest it could be from the knee would be five or six inches, correct? Yes. Then again, it also might have been towards the patient, too. Correct? That's possible. Now, is it your opinion that it would be difficult for a person who is laying in bed to touch an area in, in the area of, to, to touch a place in the, in the area of their knee? Uh, I think in general it would not be very difficult. Okay. Now, did, did uh, Dr. Kalmus, she also stated that someone with medical knowledge or experience would have to have started the IV, correct? Yes. Now, we know from Dr. Murray's statement that he started the IV, don't yeah. we? Yes. Now, does she also then after that say anyone could have drawn up and administered the medications after the IV was started? Yes. And if the medications were already drawn up, it would have been easy for anybody to insert into that IV and inject the, the, the remainder. Uh, in that hypothetical situation, yes. But if they did inject it to, to safely do it, they'd have to do it gradually, wouldn't they? Yes. But if they just bolus dosed, what I mean, just pushes it, push it all at once on top of a 0.169 level of lorazepam, that can stop your heart, can it? Yes. If a problem developed while putting in a 25 milligram dose slowly, <clears throat> if it was somebody other than Michael Jackson, that person you would expect to see the problem as it arises, wouldn't you? Uh, you would hope that they would. Uh, nothing further at this time, Your Honor. Flanagan, thank you. We do correct examination by the people. Mr. Walgren. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Rogers, I want to ask you about a, uh, something that had been brought up earlier, and that was that defense counsel had indicated previously, previous to your testimony, that a decedent with their eyes wide open, that was evidence that they had uh, died quickly or instantaneously. Is there any truth to that statement? Uh, no. People can die slowly and still have uh, eyes wide open? Yes. Uh, in Dr. Kalmus's report, uh, she also indicates that the oxygen tank that was recovered from the house was, in fact, uh, empty when she checked it uh, sometime in July. Is that accurate? That's a mistake, Your Honor. What does the date in July? The objection is sustained. Well, Mr. Flanagan just asked you extensively about... Uh, Dr. Kalmus' uh, report and her findings. She also indicated the oxygen tank uh, that was recovered was when analyzed at the coroner's office on July 13, 2009. That oxygen tank was empty, correct? Yes. Now, would you agree that most of the questioning by Mr. Flanagan of you centered on the area of uh, pharmacology and pharmacokinetics and things of that nature? I'm sorry. Zero. Overruled. You may answer it. Would you agree that most of the questions asked of you by Mr. Flanagan centered on the area of pharmacology and pharmacokinetics and things of that nature? Yes. Okay. That's not your area of expertise, is it? No. Have you ever published any articles 
or done any detailed research in the area of pharmacology, pharmacokinetics, and things of that nature? No. And what is pharmacology, generally speaking? Um, well, it relates to what happens to drugs when they get into the body. How are they distributed? How are they inactivated? How long do they remain active? Things like that. And you've not published in that area, and you're not an expert in that area, fair? That's correct. And you are an expert forensic pathologist determining the cause of death. Yes. In fact, you've devoted your entire career to the field of forensic pathology and determining the cause of death. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. You're not an expert on propofol and how it uh, uh, works through the body in a pharmacological sense, are you? No. You're not an expert on lorazepam and how it works through your body, uh, body from a pharmacological sense, are you? No. Now, you were speaking about the therapeutic ranges or the therapeutic range of propofol, but in fact what, what you indicated was that uh, death can occur anywhere from 1 to 17 micrograms per milliliter. Is that accurate? Yes. And one is certainly less than the levels we see in this case, true? Yes. Are you aware that both these uh, uh, lorazepam bottles that were presented to you by Mr. Flanagan, respectively peoples 107 and 108, or excuse me, uh, 107 and 187, uh, are you aware that these were both prescribed by Dr. Conrad Murray? I did not notice when they were up here. Okay, well, let me show you. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? Okay. Showing you people's 107, the lorazepam 2 milligram prescription. Do you see the prescribing doctor on that pill bottle? Uh, yes. Who is it? That is Conrad Murray. And on the back of that, it indicates a date, filled date of April 28, 2009? Yes. And this is the bottle then that was prescribed on April 28, 2009, so two months before his death, that originally had 30 pills and there's still nine and a half remaining. True? Yes. Let me show you people's 187. This Loraz empty, uh, discarded lorazepam bottle. Uh, who is the prescribing doctor in regard to that item? The of the bottle is having been discarded, Your Honor, was found in the bathroom. The objection is sustained. Re-ask the question, please. Regarding uh, People's 187, this empty bottle with no lid of lorazepam, who is the prescribing doctor? Uh, that is Conrad Murray. And the, uh, the fill date on that? Uh, that would be 4209. Almost three months prior to Michael Jackson's death, a little, little less than three months? Yes. And this also had an uh, original quantity of 30? Yes. Now, Mr. Flanagan had asked you uh, about a number of parent defense uh, hypotheticals regarding uh, if someone consumed lorazepam pills uh, via self-administration, right? Yes. Now, if you were to assume uh, that the benzodiazepines, the two separate, do well, let me back up. I want you to assume for purposes of this hypothetical uh, that let's just assume for the sake of argument uh, that Conrad Murray was telling the truth in his interview that he started the night by giving Michael Jackson uh, a diazepam tablet, that throughout the night he gave two separate uh, IV administrations of midazolam at two milligrams each, and throughout the night he also gave two separate lorazepam IV administrations of two milligrams each, uh, and that he also gave 25 milligrams of propofol. Um, in that scenario, and then additionally assuming that apparently he left the patient alone so he could swallow lorazepam pills, additionally left the patient alone so he could go 
to the restroom for two minutes. Additionally, that there's no monitoring equipment, there's no EKG machine, there's a pulse oximeter with no audible alarm, there's no capnography, uh, there's no resuscitative equipment, there's no airway management equipment, uh, and that he comes back into the room to find uh, a deceased patient. In that scenario, where the standard of care uh, provided the doc by the doctors, as I described, isn't it your opinion that this would still be a homicide? Objection, Your Honor. It's beyond the expertise. The objections are ruled under 801. Yes. And with the same assumption of facts as relayed by Dr. Murray, uh, but let's assume uh, he didn't take lorazepam, but instead he self-administered uh, propofol when Dr. Murray uh, abandoned him in the room. Would you also be of the opinion that it was still a homicide based on the gross negligence of Conrad Murray? The court's going to interpose its own objection uh, as argumentative. We ask the question, please. The same set of facts that I, that I mentioned, uh, but now instead of uh, self-administration, as Mr. Flanagan was suggesting, of lorazepam, uh, let's assume uh, self-administration of propofol. Uh, under those facts, where Dr. Murray then leaves his patient uh, with the, apparently the drugs accessible and no monitoring equipment, et cetera, uh, isn't it true you'd still deem it a homicide? Objection. Your Honor, assumes facts on the evidence. Overall, jurors will decide what facts are uh, essential here and what they find to be true. 801, you may answer. Yes. Thank you. Nothing further. Mr. Walgren, thank you. Request examination. Mr. Flanagan. There was an oxygen tank inspected on July 13th. Was it? Uh, he Yes, and I'm taking this from Dr. Kalmi's consultation. Uh, on July 13th, when it was inspected, was it open or closed, the valve? Uh, I don't know. I, I personally did not do the inspection. Okay. Uh, how long would it take a, an oxygen tank that was in use to empty? That would depend on how far open you had the valve. Well, if you were using it in a therapeutic amount of oxygen, would you expect it to empty in two weeks? Uh, yes, probably. Now, Mr. Walgren's asking, you haven't published any articles on pharmacology and you're not an expert on pharmacology, does your occupation as a forensic examiner, forensic pathologist, require some knowledge of pharmacology? Uh, it does require some knowledge. I mean, you've got, when you make a determination that a, a, a certain drug is a causative factor in, in, in a death, you should know what the blood level of that drug means, shouldn't you? Objection. Uh, Syndicate knows what that blood level means. Overruled. You may answer it. Yes. And when you make a determination that propofol is the cause of death, you should know what the levels of propofol are and what they mean, correct? Yes. And when you make a, a determination that lorazepam is also a cause of the death, you should know what lorazepam levels mean, shouldn't you? Yes. And in this case, you don't know that, do you? A rule, you may answer. Well, I think, I think my testimony was that I'm not sure how we got to these particular numbers that the toxicologists found. However, having found the numbers that we did, I believe that these levels are the cause of death. The levels are the cause of death, uh, 2.6 and 0.169? Primarily the 2.6. 
That, that would be the propofol. Well, one. the 0.169 in relationship to causing a person to be in a highly sedated, sedated state, the 0.169 is much higher than 2.6 in propofol, isn't it? Objection irrelevant comparison. Do you understand the question? Uh, no. Sustain. Do you know that? Well, you you reviewed Schaefer's report. Schaefer's report indicates a 0.19 level of rasipam would put the person unresponsive to painful stimulus. You recall reading that? Yes. And we got a guy here. It's 0.169, which is about one pill beyond anesthetic for major surgery, lorazepam. Isn't that correct? I'm not familiar with the use of lorazepam for major surgery. Are you familiar with lorazepam being at a level where the person is not responsive to painful stimulus? Yes. That level is 0.19, correct? Approximately, yes. And if he wasn't responsible for painful stimulus, you could do anything to him you wanted, couldn't you? I'm not sure that's true. I, I, don't, I don't know that lorazepam would give you sufficient anesthesia to do surgery. Well, if you use the term unresponsive to painful stimulus, that means the person's not going to feel it when you stick a knife in them, doesn't it? That's true. Now, the lorazepam level in this case, on the other hand, was 2.6 micrograms per milliliter. And for that to be beyond unresponsive to painful stimulus, you've got to go all the way up to 5.2, don't you? Objection, this testimony. 2.6 related to propofol, not lorazepam. Uh, I, 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 I misstated 2.6 level of propofol. That is, that is not the level unresponsive to painful stimulus, is it? Uh, that is correct. According to Schaefer's report, you've got to go to 5.2, don't you? Uh, something like that. Twice the level. Double, correct? Objection, what you know is, I mean, I... I don't know if he has a report in front of him. I don't know. Overall, if you're able to answer. So, so the question again is... Okay, sustain the objection. We ask a question. Okay. In order to get to the unresponsive to painful stimulus level with propofol, you've got to be about a, point, about a 5.2, don't you? Uh, that is according to Dr. Schaefer, yes. And Dr. Schaefer's an anesthesiologist, correct? Yes. And that would be double the level that you found in the femoral vein. And Mr. Jackson, wouldn't it? Yes. Now, you were asked to assume that Ms. Dr. Murray was telling the truth with respect to a 10 milligram pill of Valium at, at 1 o'clock. Toxicology levels bear that out as being probable, don't they? Uh, toxicology is consistent with that, yes. And Dr. Murray says he gave. Uh, Two milligrams of midazolam at three, and you gave two milligrams at seven thirty. And the toxicology levels bear that out, don't they? Yes. And if Dr. Murray's telling the truth and slowly infuses twenty-five milligrams of propofol, you wouldn't expect it to get anywhere near two point six, would you? Assuming that that is all he infuses, yes. 
And if Dr. Murray was telling the truth when he said he gave two milligrams of lorazepam at two and two milligrams of lorazepam at five, according to Schaefer's report, you would expect about a 0.02 level of lorazepam, wouldn't you? Uh, yes. So what we have here, we got more propofol, and we got a whole lot more lorazepam, don't we? Section B. Sustain. In the bloodstream. Way more propofol. Well, actually, if the propofol, rather than being slowly infused over three to five minutes, was jammed all at once. You could get that point, that 2.6 level, couldn't you? You might get it locally. I, I don't know if you would get it after everything had equilibrated. You've got Dr. Schaefer's report in front of you? I do not. Do you have his diagram of a bolus infusion of uh, 25 milligrams of propofol? No. Now, I'll withdraw that. Your Honor, that, that's all I have. Mr. Flanagan, thank you. We redirect. Thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Not a reopening of direct or a reopening of redirect, but re redirect. Dr. Rogers, why did you do a consultation with Dr. Colmus, uh, an anesthesiologist? Overruled. Uh, because this is a complex problem involving anesthesia, and I thought that it would be better to have her look at it to see if she had any insight. Okay, and she uh, indicated that these. Uh, the levels of propofol found on the toxicology exam are similar to those found during general anesthesia for major surgery, correct? Yes. Okay. And you consulted with this outside source because uh, it was beyond your area of expertise, this issue of anesthesia and uh, getting into issues of pharmacology, correct? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Walkman. We recross, again, based upon we redirect. Thank you. One of the reasons why you slowly infuse it because that gives it an opportunity to start metabolizing while you're infusing it, doesn't it? Overall, correct? Uh, well, I understand the reason to mainly be that you want to dilute it. In other words, you want, you want to slowly give it into a flowing stream of blood so that it doesn't all bunch up in one piece. So you don't get a whole lot yes. just at one time hitting the brain. Yes. And Dr. Thomas told you that uh, that the unfavorable properties of propofol include respiratory and cardiovascular depression, especially on induction or if the IV bolus is rapid. Isn't that correct? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Dr. Rogers, step down, subject to recall. Mr. Walgren? Yes, thank Mr. you, Mr. Flanagan? Yes, Your Honor. Dr. Rogers, thank you for your testimony. Sir, please don't discuss your testimony or the facts of the case with any other witnesses until we finish the trial. And while you may step down and leave, you are to remain on call and you're subject to recall. Thank you. Thank you. Can I see the attorney?
going to take the break. I actually had to force the attorneys to agree to take the break. <laughs> so with that in mind, please bear in mind these admonitions. I know you've been very patient with me, and it's important that we uh, have your full undivided attention. Do not discuss this case among yourselves or with anyone else or form or express any opinions about this case until it is submitted finally to you. Do not visit any scene or location that may have been referenced, mentioned, or involved in the case. Don't perform any experiments or on your own or through another person conduct any investigation on any topics, subjects, or persons mentioned or involved in the case. Do not have any contact whatsoever with any television or radio programs, newspaper or magazine articles, or books regarding any of these topics, subjects, or persons. Do not on your own or through another person access any internet websites whatsoever, including but not limited to any search engine sites such as Google, Ask, or Bing, or social networking sites including but not limited to MySpace or Facebook, nor text or tweet, or access any text or tweets, or read any messages or blogs or post any messages on any blogs regarding any topics, subjects, or persons mentioned or involved in the case. Have no contact whatsoever with the defendant, the attorneys, the witnesses, or spectators. If anyone tries to talk to you about any aspects of this case or otherwise tries to communicate with you by handing you a business card so that at a later point in time you can contact the person or organization immediately end that conversation or communication and immediately report any such interaction to members of the court staff or security. We're going to ask that you join us tomorrow at uh, 845, at which time we expect to resume this case. And in the meantime, once again, thank you for your patience, and we'll have you out of here in a very short period of time. Good evening. See you tomorrow.